Before I start talking about the Etruscans, I want to let you know that they used to be Mackenzie. Uh, that they used to be called Etruscans, but when they went digital, they call them Etruscans. Nobody laughed at that in the other section. Just say, that's why I had to get an education. I wasn't doing stand up comedy. So, before we go there, I have some of your submissions for quiz two, but I don't have all of them. And I'd like to start off by asking you guys if you have any questions about that. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Paragraph two and three. Let me, let me. Uh, do that and this and assignment and prompt and let me put this back on the recording. Uh, share screen. This is it. Real good. Uh, paragraph two, a sampling of results. And uh, in a moment, I think I'll call up the library website and go through that again on how to get to what you need. But what I want you to do in paragraph two is just write a paragraph outlining or telling about the kinds of things in general that you're finding in your search. And I talk about interdisciplinary connections. Basically, uh, what I'm talking about is that in these articles, you're going to find things like DNA analysis, geology, chemistry, physics, all different kinds of things, chemical analysis of the pigment, of the materials, uh, archaeology, etc. So I want you to write that as paragraph two. Now, this can be a narrative. It doesn't have to be a formal um, uh, writing, but what I want you to do is to find those kind of interdisciplinary connections. And I want you to cut, or I want you to copy those sources and put those in your bibliography slash endnotes. Just give me the source. And so what do I mean by interdisciplinary? Those things that are not, you know, like narrowly defined as art. And they can go in, you can do in a paragraph, how should I say this? What is a paragraph? group of sentences expressing a single or unified thought. So you can start off with, here are some of the internet in the interdisciplinary connections I found in my search on whatever your subject is. And you can say it, they, they were pretty diverse, ranging from archaeology and 
anthropology, through history, through uh, various sciences, satellite imagery, DNA analysis, just write them out. And uh, typically a paragraph begins with that introductory sentence and ends with either a conclude, concluding sentence or a transitional sentence. And you can do that either way. You can say, and I was quite surprised at all of the different areas touched by the single work of art, or you can do a transition sentence that says, and one of the most uh, interesting, bless you, is this, the one specific example, and choose uh, one of the search results of interest to you from the abstract or from the article Describe the nature of the interdisciplinary tools used in this specific article. And so I want you to kind of dig a little deeper on one of them. And so how about if I do this? Do I have... No, I thought I had a hot link here to the library. Want to take a look at the library site? See, through the university library, articles, full text, peer review. That's what you need to do. And I got to move this down here so I can get a new tab. Uh, And there it is. And so as I showed you, this is the home page. And so what you want to do is articles here. Hit that. And let's say we're doing King Tut. That's why I left King Tut alone. He may be a good example for me to show you. King Tut. I got articles, search. Whoa. There's only 14,000 of these. That was another reason I said don't do Tut. There's way too much. But after this, I want you to put a couple of limiters in this. And Peer reviewed first. Let's see what that brought it down to. Only almost 3,000, but it reduced it by four fifths. And if you want, you can do full text, but it doesn't really have to be both. Full text is so you can actually look at it. Full text, that brought that down from 3,000, not very much. That's why I say I don't really have to do that. And so here's what I'm talking about. The stuff you'll find is an academic journal. And so if you click on here, say, journals, it will think you're asking for the journal title, King Tut. That's why you have to use articles and then limit your search from there. And so anyway, paragraph two. Well, we could talk about this. African-American culture, 
art museums, museum exhibits, African Americans, African culture, humanity, black communities, commodities, cultural institutions. Now, I don't really have to uh, read this. I know enough about King Tut. And that is that uh, for many centuries, the Western world kind of looked at Tut as uh, Egyptian and kind of more or less uh, not African. But if you take a look at the map, you'll see that Egypt is squarely in Africa and on top of which, the Egyptian empire ran the entire length of the Nile. You go all the way down the Nile or up the Nile because it's reversed. Uh, you'll see that they had traded and interacted with people from East Central Africa, places like modern day Uganda and, and so on. So anyway, that is all good stuff for paragraph two. Paragra this does not have a lot there to offer on this number two hit. But see, like this one, this subject hit, never mind. But in this, astrophysics, nuclear and particle physics. Atomic energy, radioactivity. These are all things that who would have thought you would have been able to get out of King Tut. And so, yes. So, um, instead of being just in the science, okay, good question. Here is what I want you to do as you write down, say, the subjects, you're listing those for paragraph two, and what you should be doing is copy this and put that in your endnote slash bibliography, just like that, period. Uh, we're going to do a little bit more extensive and dig a little deeper on citations and stuff as we go along. But for right now, this will do. So you would have all of these in paragraph two. This would be in the end notes. Make sense? Okay. Is the end notes just like the bibliography at the very end? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I use that interchangeably, okay. but yeah. And number one is always our textbook. And so after that, just paste these here. And so um, what I was saying about that, we get, are we good on paragraph two? And then I said for paragraph three, kind of drill down and give a, a, a more detailed example. Well, for that, you're going to either need, you're going to have to find one that has what we call an abstract. And this is just random here. But I just clicked on that. And this is the abstract. The article describes the turquoise glass writing palette found in the tomb of King Tutankhamun. So this is where you get your information for paragraph three. Uh, And this one's kind of short. Some of them are a little longer. And some of them like this 
won't even have an abstract. So you kind of got to look around and find one with an abstract. It's not required. And sometimes you'll see an abstract actually listed up here. But mostly you got to click on it. Results, come on. And so if you're getting a lot of other stuff, you can do this too. This is a little trick, but backspaces. And that kind of cleans it up a little bit. And see, that reduced it down too. That's what I want you guys to know, is how to use this resource effectively, because in a lot of ways, Maryville's got a great library. And so, let me see if there's an abstract here. No, but there's a description, which will work for paragraph three as well. And, uh, and basically you can take large chunks out of this. This is what I want you to, to know about. And, you know, the subject terms, look at this, it's like so cool. Decorated wooden stick. That's what they're analyzing. And they take this one piece out of the King Tut's tomb and then gilded bark, wood identification, x ray fluorescence, Fourier transfer, in, infrared spectroscopy. Spec you say it. Spectro. Spec spectroscopy, archaeology, social science. And so, yeah, so that is really what we want. Uh, and so, any more questions? And this stuff I showed you here, I want to kind of clarify this a little. And that is when I change this up here. See, sometimes, and I don't understand this search engine, but sometimes it'll throw into the search subject. All of that other gobbledygook that I Z plus A D something search, you know, whatever. So yeah, you can typically just delete that part and stay focused on your subject. And so I think this has all been recorded on uh Zoom, and I'll try to have this. I don't know if I'll be able to have it up by the end of the day. It takes a long time for these recordings because they're about an hour long or more. I got to put them on YouTube. YouTube has to go through them and they make sure I'm not using any copyrighted materials and stuff like that, or that it's not other dubious content. So, oh, 
And let me make sure that I have the right share. There it is. That's another thing that's kind of funny here is how Zoom does not always follow my mouse clicks. Anyway, no other questions. Let's talk about the e Cruscan. How about if they were the first digital culture? Is that working? Still not funny. You're a tough audience. Maybe we should sell liquor. Never mind. Uh, so before we get to talk about these guys, I wanted to show you something else too. While we're especially while we're talking about research. And I put together a bunch of links of just different stuff that I found. Actually, I found most of these in my email. And uh, because I, I do a lot of searching around here, I like this kind of know about the stuff I'm trying to teach. And so anyway, I get these articles, emails and stuff from a lot of different sources and typically pertaining to art, both ancient art and sometimes even more modern or modern art. And so I went through there and, and picked some of these out. And so bottom line, is that I'm not sure all of the links work. I showed this to my other section and some of the links did not work because this computer does not have my sub subscriber credentials already in because like a, it's on my laptop, it automatically lets me in. But most of these are public and most of these you can get. And the other thing is, if you uh, can't get to something you wanna see, you can copy this and run it in a search engine and typically it will take you to where you wanna go without a subscription. And so, talking about this stuff, This is from Smithsonian. And you see, sign up. But it still let me in. And this is a farmer stumbles into Egyptian pharaoh's 2,600-year-old stone slab. And here's a picture of it. And I put these sites together or these links together because I want to impress upon you exactly how fast the knowledge base is expanding. And we're finding more stuff all the time. And about art history, which is kind of what we're looking at, but human history as well. And they're both interconnected. It's one of the activities. It's one, probably one of the oldest disciplines, uh, aside from hunting, excuse me, hunting and gathering, and religion and art making. You know, I think. And so anyway, archaeologists are working to decipher the slab's fifteen lines of hieroglyphics. And so anyway. They kind of figured out what it is and about how old it is and so on. Uh, and this one just came in the other day. I thought this was really very interesting just on for my own. edification, ancient footsteps. 
Okay, this is September 24th, just last week. Ancient footsteps suggest humans lived in the Americas earlier than once thought. That's really kind of important in a lot of ways. There are a lot of places we don't look for evidence of the existence of human cultures. And there's the kind of a logic to it. First of all, most of the discoveries in modern times, past five, 800 years, have centered around those cultures that actually made, constructed large buildings. That's like kind of a clue that hits you over the head. Boom, we got some pyramids here. There must've been some people here 4,500 years ago. Or there's these ziggurats in Mesopotamia, the palace at Knossos, the Parthenon. And so we kind of center our archeological uh, interest around those places. And on top of that, maybe some places that have been written about in recorded history, but we kind of leave some of these places alone because we had previously believed that people did not live here at that time. And so now we're global, we're digital, we share information, we got satellite technology to kind of point to some anomalies on the surface of the earth that say, hey, this looks like somebody may have lived here at one time. And so anyway, this says here that they uh, think that there were indigenous Americans here 21 centuries ago. 21,000, 21, about 21 millennia, excuse me, years ago. And so that is and so here's the thing. I'm gonna show you this because uh and they have uh archaeologists who have claimed human artifacts in a Mexican cave at least twenty six hundred, I mean excuse me, twenty-six thousand years ago. So you remember the dates when we were looking at Lascaux and Altamira and those cave sites in South Europe? Those were like 12, 14, 15,000 years old. So we may have people in the Americas doing the same thing, same time, game changer. And so, um, here we go. Uh, and it's not always uh, new stuff. And they hear uh, the Rosetta Stone unlike this, unlock the secrets. And I want to make sure I had this one in there. Let me make sure I got my screen share. Oh, there. Yeah, that's what. And so we got to add how the Rosetta Stone unlocks secrets of ancient civilizations. I showed you guys the Rosetta Stone, and uh, I, I am actually in a lot of ways surprised that that's not included in this textbook because in many covering ancient Egypt, this is like, this is like a big deal. And so anyway, it tells, this is what I'm talking about. You want me to, my credentials are not on there. So anyway, uh, uh, 
Um, And so anyway, uh, I looked into this, this uh, Viking grave, and I kind of figured out that this Viking grave, she was a woman warrior, probably a leader. Uh, and then I started knocking around on this, and it's like PBS or Netflix or somebody has done a whole series of films on this woman warrior. But at any rate, and pictures of it, but, and, but here's what I wanted to show you out of this. These articles that I'm showing you typically have something like this embedded in their story. American Journal of Physical Anthropology. So even though this is not a peer-reviewed article, it's a news magazine from the Smithsonian. And they post news about different kinds of things, history-related, Smithsonian. But almost all of them are based in some kind of scientific journal. Uh, Live Science is another journal. Antiquity, another peer reviewed journal. So I'm teaching you guys how to, some of you probably know already, but I wanna walk you guys into being comfortable with looking at peer reviewed journal sources because this is this is huge. It gives you, it's got your back when it comes to research. And so, oh, darn. What did I do? Ah, here we go. This, share. And can I resume this? Slideshow. And so even articles from places like Popular Mechanics, Fox News, Iron Age Warriors Found with Weapons in Russia, Mona Lisa, they're finding with because they have the high-powered X-ray machines, finding that there's some other drawings under the Mona Lisa. Who would have thought? Uh, the Elgin marbles. These are the pediment sculptures from the Parthenon that were taken 200 years ago from Greece and put into the British Museum. This is a good article. I would just say if you're really interested in this, this is a good source because it pretty much lays out both sides of the argument. The argument being Greece says, we got the Parthenon, we're trying to restore it. It's our heritage. We want to put pediment sculptures back up in pediment. England is saying, well, we got some documents that say, bless you, that we, uh, that we bought them. We paid money for them, whoever the government was in Greece 200 years ago, gave us, we got the receipt. Secondly, why are you picking on us? We actually saved them. As many wars and things that have happened in Greece the last 200 years, if we didn't have them, they would probably been gone, destroyed, stolen, something. But it's all in here. It's a really good article. And uh, it's from ParthenonUK.com. Ancient coffins. So here we are. Let me double check my share. Oh, wait. Uh, sure. 
This is where we want. Okay. Back to the subject at hand. Uh, as we talked about in this class, we looked at the Aegean cultures, the Cycladic Island group, Crete, which was the Minoan culture, the palace at Knossos, and then we moved into the larger island of Peloponnesus. And we talked about Sparta, all in leading up to Greek art. Well, we kind of got to do the same thing here again. We got a pre-Roman Italian culture. Same way that the Greeks evolved, developed into Greek culture and civilization. Likewise, this happened on the Italian peninsula. And so uh, Greece is in the eastern part of the Mediterranean Sea, close to Asia, say Turkey, and, and just due north of Egypt. Well, this is all west of all of that. This is in the central Mediterranean Sea. And you see, this is the Italy in. Got to move this. I don't know what the date is on it. Etruscan times. The navigate. So this is what the Etruscan culture looked like, and it looked exactly like modern day Italy. And so here we go. Where's Rome right there in the center? But look at all of these other places. And some of these are still cities like Florence and Naples, for example. But this is pre-Roman Italy. And so what we're talking about is circa 520 BCE. So this is kind of really still in the geometric period, or excuse me, the archaic period of Greek culture and as we know, they traded with the Greeks. And there's this same kind of cross-pollination that we see in Etruscan culture that we saw the cross-pollination between Egyptian and, and Greek culture. We saw the early stuff, especially from Crete and and the Aegean Sea, modern stuff was very close. We saw some of the uh, geometric and archaic Greek sculptures, and we compared them to Egyptian sculptures, and they looked pretty similar. That's gonna happen here. And so this is the tomb of the augurs, Mata Rossi Necropolis. One thing that the uh, Etruscans did that was really kind of different than what we've seen before is that uh, they build cities, they call them necropolis. Necro means dead, opolis means city, like Indianapolis, Minneapolis. So, they built these little cities where they buried their dead. And it wasn't just kings and, and royalty and generals and stuff. From what we could tell, it was really a lot of different kinds of people across the whole social strata. And so they built these that are quite elaborate and they decorated them. And you see this, the way this is painted, this is really kind of close to stylistically to the kind of painting we see on Greek pottery. And we don't, for some reason, we don't really have a whole lot of 
Greek painting to look at, but we do look at their pottery as an indication of what they were doing with two-dimensional art. And this is very similar to that. And this is a fibula with orientalizing lions. And so this is again from a ne necropolis. What we probably today call a cemetery, but it was a little more than that because they built these little houses and things for their dead. And they did bury them with some things, not quite on the scale of King Tut, but with things that they had, their possessions. And I've always been interested in this. Isn't this is a gold fibula, which is kind of like a pin on badge. You wear it like a brooch or something. And so the orientalizing lions, we tend to believe that this is a stylistic thing and not a depiction of an actual species. We've talked about that in here too especially when we looked at Mesopotamian art and we saw the lions depicted and we knew that because of skeletal remains and stuff that there was a species of Asiatic lions that lived in that area. But these, these are a little much too stylized, but anyway, shows what they could accomplish with art. And you see that they understood repetition, various different kinds of surface texture. It's actually quite a nice piece of jewelry. And here is an Etruscan temple or a model of what we believe an Etruscan temple looked like. And again, this is what I'm talking about. We kind of have mapped out the places that actually built temples and, and pyramids and sphinxes and stuff like that. That's a little ziggurats. But we don't really have an Etruscan temple to show you, but we have found enough remains. And look at these columns. They don't fit the model for Greek columns looks more like the columns from the palace at Knossos, which had red columns and didn't have any fluting, which is those carved in vertical lines on the columns. They were kind of funny, but they were red. This is, and they had the hypo style going, which means that columns used to hold up the, the structure. They have the pediment, but with an exaggerated roof line. But in some ways, this is kind of like what we see in Greek architecture as well. Now you got to understand this is in the 500s BCE, so it kind of predates the Parthenon by, you know, probably about a hundred years. And another thing that they did is that they decorated their temples with statues, even putting them above the pediment and around the perimeter on the roof. And we saw that with the Parthenon and, and the whole of uh, the Acropolis. Whoa, there's another polis, Acropolis city. Anyway. And so this is uh, this, and it was as dis described as uh, Vitruvius, and ancient scholar, writer. And so sometimes when we have written history, we can kind of put some things together with that. So the Greeks were very fluent. They wrote a lot. And, and as I said before, they kind of were open about their knowledge and stuff in a way that other cultures held knowledge secret. That goes back and forth, by the way, through the ages. But at any rate, this is a time where we're actually a little bit more small democratic.
And so this is a Pulu, which is what we believe the Etruscan equivalent of Apollo, a Greek god. Apollo was the was in that second generation of Greek gods, and he was one that stressed calm intellectual responses, very intellectual, very stoic, very measured. Whereas Dionysus is, on the other hand, more of a party guy up for the pleasures and reckless behaviors and things. Anyway, we see that and we see that they're adopting Greek gods. This is painted terracotta. Anybody know what terracotta is? Yes. Clay. Yes, ma'am. Very good. And we still use it sometimes. You know those red pots you get at the floral garden shop? That's terracotta. It's clay. And again, this is another thing. The word culture is always used, typically what's readily available to them to make their art. And so what we see in the Nile, we see a lot of sandstone and limestone. Here, we're, and in Greece, we see marble all over the place. And in the Italian peninsula, a lot of clay and a lot of volcanic rock, which, as I said, this whole part of the earth is very, has a lot of volcanoes and subsequently a lot of earthquakes. But at any rate, you can see this is almost like the archaic style of Greece, contemporary with the archaic style. And you can see they, they're attempting to describe the drapery. It's not particularly accurate, but it's not inaccurate either. It's just kind of a simple solution. And again, we find this, we'll find this for a long time. I'm kind of working up ahead, see that we still have, we'll still have these questions on whether these people actually wore their hair, facial hair, hair on the head this way, whether it was all braided and fixed this way or, or if it was an artistic convention. But bottom line, this is life size, five feet, 11 high. And it takes a lot from Greek art. One thing that uh, we see emerge with the Etruscans, and I, I showed you the, and we talked about the necropolis, what they do is that they bury their dead, oftentimes in these things it's a sarcophagus it's a it's a casket is what it is and typically they would have sculptures representations of the people inside of this casket and oftentimes husband and wife were buried together a couple would share for eternity the same coffin and they would do these sculptures and again, terracotta. And they would kind of give you a little indication of sometimes what they did, who they were, and so on. Uh, here's, uh, here's an outside view of Bandi Takachia Necropolis. And you can see these are the little buildings that I was talking about. And on the inside, this is what they look like. Uh, this is some of that volcanic rock. 
that I was talking about. That's what this whole thing is carved out of. You can see it's not marble, it's not sandstone, it's volcanic rock. Uh, this book doesn't get into the various kinds of volcanic rock, but that's not necessary. But see, Tomb of the Shields and Chairs. And so inside this one, we got places for people to sit. And these are the shields. And we think that probably this was a place where warriors, dead warriors were buried. We don't have the sarcophagi in here, but that's a pretty good indication, the shields. Tomb of the Relief. And this is all carved out of volcanic rock too. And I sure wish I had a light block in here because you know, I really apologize because of the poor visibility of these slides. But this is kind of like the same idea that we see out of ancient Egypt, that they bury their dead and they didn't like leave them with all of this stuff, but they had representations. All of this stuff is carved out of the volcanic rock. And so they got some rope, they got a machete, they got a pickaxe, they got some kind of amphora vessel here, uh, rope, et cetera, et cetera. Pots, pans, things that you'd use to cook. Basically like Egyptian tombs where the dead would have what they needed in the afterlife. And so this is the tomb of the reliefs, and it's called a relief because these are sculptures, like we talk about low relief, bas relief. Relief is carved out of the surface. And so, and sometimes again, tomb of the leopards, and these are all named after what we can actually see, the shields, uh, the reliefs, the leopards, and so what we have here again is that same kind of painting, and the leopards here are on top, which is kind of a, a distinction as well. We've seen a lot of lions fulfill this function as guardians, symbolic guardians like the Lion Gate from ancient Greece. Lions guarding royal palaces in Mesopotamia and so on. So leopards, two of the leopards and some more painting. And as you can see, they're in various stages of repair. Some are a little more pristine. Some of them have weathered not so well. And, uh, and again, diving and fishing. There's the diver. There are the birds. And the activity down here, we see some guys in a boat fishing. So we kind of figure that they're in the boat. This guy's going head first. It's water. And it's a fresco. And and this is like the huge one. Of all of Etruscan art, this piece stands alone as probably the most significant and the culturally the most important work of their culture. It's called the Capitoline Wolf, and it's said from Rome, Italy, circa 500, 480 before Common Era. And it's cast bronze. But what is so important about this, and this is like something that really points to what's happening in the near future in Italy, Rome. So this is called a Capilatine wolf. That's a modern name. We've called this a she-wolf for centuries. 
And this is, anybody know the story of the she-wolf? Oh, glad I'm bringing you new information. Because the she-wolf, this is like real, really kind of a big deal. The she-wolf is a mythical creature. And the myth surrounding the she-wolf is this, that these two little boys were abandoned by their mother. And the she-wolf adopted them, so to speak. She fed them. You can see them feeding at her. She feeding out, out of her breast here. Bottom line, she raised them. And they survived, and they became two very strong young men. Those two guys are Romulus and Remus. And they are the mythological founders of Rome. They are the ones that founded Rome, and subsequently it developed into an empire. And Partly, at least the way the mythology goes, is that the uh, Romans were really so strong because they came from these two strong men raised in the wild by a wolf. And so because they are Roman, they are like Romulus and Remus. And so anyway, it, it persists in the centuries. And so this wasn't discovered right away. And it was kind of lost to history for a while. And these two statues, it says, or 12th century CE, because these two figures, Romulus and Remus, we don't know if they're actually created at the same time as this statue of the she-wolf or put there later, like 2,000 years later. But the she-wolf, part of mythology, and this was something that was actually kind of understandable for centuries. We don't think this way anymore. Thankfully, we don't. But in ancient times, through medieval times, and in many cultures around the world, when people did not want their children for whatever reason, maybe some kind of uh, some kind of uh, issue of like maybe having like only one arm, have some kind of irregularity in their bodies or just didn't want the children for whatever reason, they would take these children out into the forest and just leave them on a tree stump and go away and let the wolves eat the babies. I know it sounds horrible. It is horrible. But that's what they did. And I got to add to this, that those kinds of, that kind of practice, it really kind of still persisted through medieval times in Europe. And so a lot of our, <laughs> this is weird, but children's stories, like the Big Bad Wolf and Little Red Riding Hood, that's kind of based out of this same practice. Hansel and Gretel had a, a stepmother who was jealous and wanted to get rid of Hansel and Gretel and took them out into the woods. Wolves, apex predators, get rid of your kids, let nature take its course. So that's what gives, um, the reason I'm saying this is that what gives this some level of credibility and it adds to the myth that these were children unwanted and cast away, left for dead. 
and they came back and they grew up to be strong men, founders of Rome. And so here's another thing that they did at Chimera, and this is a mythical beast too, which is kind of described in a lot of ways, typically a cross between a lion and a wolf, and you see the snake or the tail, the spikes, there's another head, and I think this is a goat, don't remember. Bottom line, they were big on mythological creatures and bringing it up, we've seen a lot of that. Centaurs and Minotaurs and, and the Anubis and so on. So they were kind of the same way and they, we can find that through their art. Uh, and this is a container. It's called a cista, which is water container. And it is root word for cistern, which is what you, they don't use this very much anymore. It would be a place you went it or in a dry area, you keep your water, collect your water in a cistern. But at any rate, and you see they were, they were very skilled in drawing and engraving and so on. And we know that like the Greeks, they adorned with art, a lot of many commonplace objects. In this case, a mirror, seven inch mirror, not like it belonged to a king or anything. Look at this exquisite engraving. Uh, archways, Etruscans and Romans are credited with inventing the archway. And here's a, here's a diagram of an arch construction. And basically, and I've talked about this before, we had seen vaulted arches and collar bell arches in Greece. This is a completely hemispherical arch, Hemis half a circle. Uh, but what this does is take the weight that would be on this area and distribute that weight along a much larger area. It's, it's really kind of, in some ways, kind of simple math, but you really have to kind of know your math and geometry to be able to pull this off. And so, uh, you know, like I said, we've seen some advances towards archways, but for the most part, other cultures still using the post and lentil. So anyway, what we find is some engineering advances. And here's another sarcophagus. Uh, tufa. That's a kind of volcanic rock. This is it's identified here. There's different kinds. Uh, but this is a particular kind uh, from central Italy. Uh, sarcophagus again, sarcophagus. And so we got this quite open evidence of ancestor veneration and ancestor worship. That'll be something that'll persist through the Roman years. And uh, bronze early first century BCE. So this is like right on the cusp of the founding of Rome. And it's a bronze statue. And it actually looks more like classical Greece, classical Greek sculpture. And it really does point the way to what we will see in Rome. And so I see some laptops folding. Don't see anybody. I see one guy sleeping. Anyway, I'm thinking it's close to time. I wanted to, I knew this was a short chapter. And that's why I had this time set aside to talk about the quiz. Make sure you guys were all straight about that. And so we've seen this, did the quiz. 
See you on Thursday.